in this age, in the praises of his men, he's walked so many to gather together in the name of the Most High. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. To learn from him, to drink the living water, to eat of the bread of life, to gather together today in the unity of the Holy Spirit, where his presence and his power abides in the praises of his people. Amen. Amen. And we can see the glory of God in every believer seated to the left and to the right of you because God has kept us. Amen. He's watched over us. He's made sure that we're taken care of. That no weapon formed against us has prospered. That neither death, hell, or the grave has conquered us. We are here because God is so good to us. Isn't that right? Amen. Because His mercy endures forever. His grace is sufficient for today. And this is the day that the Lord has made. And I will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. 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 He is from everlasting to everlasting. Almighty God, the King of glory. Amen. So I'm going to be, uh, yeah, let's give the Lord a hand by the praise. He is so good. He is so good. So my hope today is that if you have a little bit of faith, the size of a mustard seed, as Jesus said, then today as you hear the word of God, may his spirit increase your faith so that you walk out of here different than how you came in. That you leave here full of the spirit and power and nothing less. That you would decrease and that he would increase in you, as John the Baptist said, that in your life you would once again, or maybe for the first time, say, I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. And this life that I live, I do not live it in my own strength, but I live by faith in him who died for me and gave himself for me, that I might live eternally forever and ever secure in Him, in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Only Jesus. And only Jesus. Uh, like, like I was telling my brother this morning, he said, How are you doing today, brother? And my pastor used to tell me, Who the Holy Ghost? That's it. That's all I got today. I pray that you would not look at my circumstances or yours and trust your eyes to tell you whether you're going to be okay, but that we're going to walk by faith. And we're going to trust in the Lord with all my heart that He is on the throne and that He is still in control. And that no matter what may come, my house is built on the rock of Jesus Christ and I shall not be moved. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's open our Bibles this morning to our passage that we're going to start with. Matthew 8, 23 through 26. Look at that. Praise the Lord, it's already up on the screen. If you want to stand in reverence to God's word, that's all good. Praise the Lord. Here we go. Verse 23, And when he was entered into a ship, Jesus, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, a storm, insomuch that the ship was covered with waves. But he, Jesus, was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, Save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Thank you, Lord, for your word. You may be seated. Praise God. Excuse me. I don't know whose water this is, but it's mine. Praise God. <laughs> So Jesus was tired after all the day's ministry. I shall drink anything and it won't hurt me in any way. Jesus was tired after all the day's ministry. He saw the crowds gathering on one side of the Sea of Galilee and commanded his disciples to get in the boat and go with him to the other side. He fell asleep in the boat, which then hit a bad storm. Even the experienced boatmen were fearful and afraid that they would drown. And they cried out for Jesus to get up and save them. When Jesus wakes up, his, re his first response is not to immediately save them. Instead, he asks them, why are you afraid? And gets after them for their lack of faith. His meaning seems to be that the disciples, you and I, should be more assured of his ability to save than we are fearful. His primary concern for those who follow him 
is that we would trust him. Amen. 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 Why are you fearful, O oh, you of little faith? I know that some of us here have a little faith. But today we're going to grow that faith by the word of God because Romans 10, 17 promises us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We all need more faith. I can't grow my faith by myself. My neighbor can't give me his faith. I can't buy faith off of Amazon. My faith alone is increased by hearing, reading, meditating, knowing, learning, and memorizing the Word of God. And as a result, because I am in the Word of God, I am learning about Jesus. And I am getting to know Him on a more personal level. The Bible tells me in John 1.1 1, 1, that the Word was God and is God. Jesus is the Word made flesh. In that same passage, it calls that He came and dwelt among us. Emmanuel. And if I'm reading the Bible, I am talking to Jesus, and Jesus is talking to me. Amen? Amen. So during this last week, while I was uh, seeking to pray and prepare myself to bring a message, because I wanted it to be inspired of the Holy Ghost, right? I don't want to give you my opinion. I don't want to bring some message that, that's not going to make any sense, right? I wanted to have a message for today, something that we really needed to hear because I really want to hear from the Lord. I don't want to hear from myself. And I've noticed over these last several months, and really the last several years, especially since the introduction of COVID, and all the craziness that came with it, that the things that are going on in the world are as the scripture says in these last days that we would see according to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. And it says, but know this, that in the last days, Perilous times would come. Dangerous times would come. And this includes everything, whether it's high prices at the grocery store, high prices at the gas station, or serious inflation, which for many of us has caused the end of our money to not meet the end of our month. Many of us have struggled. Many of us are still struggling. Many of us have been anxious and worried about how we're going to make ends meet. We're also concerned for our families. Yet on another side, there are many of us who have had physical issues, health problems, mental health issues. We're worried and concerned and scared, fearful of the future, fearful of the things that may come either due to our age or our failing health or sickness or disease or consequences like me of not taking care of myself when I should have when I was younger. Oh, hello. I'm speaking to myself here. And then yet again, many of us who watch the news as a daily routine find that we're made fearful and anxious and confused by what we are told and by what we see. We see and hear of wars and rumors of wars and nations rising up against nations, which Jesus said would happen. We see calamities throughout the world, volcanoes and hurricanes and tornadoes like never before. Famine throughout the world, homelessness in our communities taking over, drug abuse is running rampant in our communities, in our cities, people stealing and robbing like never before, lawlessness all over. Governments and people in authority over us abusing their offices, lying and deceiving. And we see in these end days that we are surely living in evil running rampant. So much so that even in our schools, uh-oh, we have teachers who were once assigned to teach our children math, reading, and history are now being used by the enemy to try and scare our children into believing that they're not how God created them to be, and that's just pure evil. We see homosexuality and sexual perversion at an all-time high. LGBTQ communities forcing their agendas on us, but they don't want to hear our truth. But then they'll persecute us and call us hateful when we try to spread the message of love and of Jesus and His free pardon of sin that we might be forgiven. 
We have folks that are fearful of man because of consequences from sin. And they think that just as Adam and Eve did in the garden, when they knew they had sinned and gone wrong against God, and God went looking for them and said, Adam, where are you? They were fearful of what was to come, so they hid themselves. Are you hiding? And still many of us today are struggling with the idea that death comes for us all. And many of us are fearful of death. We wonder when, how, where. And then again, many of us are fearful of the unknown, fear of the future. It can also refer to situations where we're uncertain or unfamiliar with what's happening around us. And yet still some of us have a fear of failure. I know for myself that's something still that I've struggled with because there's so many things I've sought to do with in my life, with music, with talents, with the calling of God that's on my life that He's given me to share with the community and the world and the body of Christ. And I've many times shied away from doing those things because of fear. Maybe there's some areas in your life where you're thinking of right now of something that you know you need to do but you can't or you won't because you're struck with fear. You're stuck in the what if. What if I fail? What if I'm rejected? What if they don't like me? What if it's not God? What if it's the wrong way? Oh, but I'm here to tell you today that, beloved, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power and of love and of a sound mind. I'm going to tell you today that fear is a spirit and He is a liar. Amen. The dictionary defines fear as a painful emotion or a passion excited by an expectation of evil or the apprehension of impending danger. But to put it plain, fear is false expectations appearing real. F-E-A-R. Fear might overcome our emotions, but it never overwhelmed Jesus. He never overreacts or underreacts to a fearful situation. And I'm sitting here today to you to rouse that devil out of his nest that he's been building in your life it's time for him to leave. I've been sent with a message today to rebuke and cast that spirit of fear out of that dark corner he's been hiding in for so long in your life. 2 Corinthians 10.5 declares that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What does that mean? That means that we are at war. But our warfare is not against flesh and blood like Ephesians chapter 6 reminds us. But we do have to fight to pull down strongholds. And strongholds are set up in our minds and in our hearts. They're old patterns of thinking about ways that we perceive things to be and it should not be that way. And even though we try to think against these things, we can't fight darkness with darkness. We have to fight darkness with light. Amen. Amen. The weapons of our warfare come from the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit. The strength to fight that fight comes from the Spirit of God. That lying, conniving devil has been allowed for too long to build a fortress in our minds and our lives and our thinking to get us to believe that what he whispers in our ears, in our hurts, and in our trauma has any power at all. All our lives we've been hurt and traumatized and gone through hard situations, whether it's loved ones we've lost, pains and hurts or abuses we've endured. The devil comes in and sets up lies on top of lies on top of lies and builds strongholds to keep us down, to keep us from thinking that we can't do better or believing that we can't have more in God. He tries to keep us from believing that God can't really do anything in our lives. But if God is for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 31 through 39 says... He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? It's God who justifies, who can condemn us. Christ is the one who died for us and was raised for us, who is at the right hand of God, who is interceding for us, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing. No tribulation, no distress, no abuse, no heartache, no hurt, 
No persecution, no famine, nakedness, or danger can separate us. No sword can separate us from God's great love. So with boldness today, I declare, devil of fear in the name of Jesus, you've been exposed today. And it's time for you to get out of here in Jesus' name. You have no place here. You have no authority in our lives anymore from this day forth. Jesus has said in Luke 10, 19, He has given me and you all authority under heaven to cast out every devil, every lie, and that we have authority in the name of, above all names, in the name of Jesus, to trample over every serpent and every scorpion, and that nothing by any means would harm us. Hallelujah to Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'm here to tell you today, folks, that no longer are we going to allow the enemy to rule and reign in our life, to try and keep us down or keep us from God's blessing or from prospering. I'm no longer going to let him rule my life when it comes to giving and make me believe that I don't have enough to give. I'm going to give as though I believe that God is more than enough. Amen? Amen. When I walk out of here today, I'm going to know that when I stand up for righteousness like Daniel did and stood in front of the masses and prayed and said, I'm not going to obey what the world tells me to do, but I'm going to do what God has commanded me to do because I know that's what's right. I'm not going to seek to please men. I'm going to do what I need to do to seek the face and the favor of God. And if they throw me in the den full of lions, I know that God will keep me. He will preserve me. He will protect me. He will give His angels charge over me. And they will lift me up that I might not even dash my foot against the stone. Hallelujah to Jesus. Hallelujah. As of today, God has given me the strength that I need. And I'm going to walk knowing that I have the victory in every situation. Because God always causes me to triumph. It says so in 2 Corinthians 2.14. So I'm no longer going to fear failure. I'm going to try to do everything God wills every time He asks. And if I fail, I'm going to get back up again. And if I fail again, I'm going to get back up again. Because a righteous man falls seven times, but he gets up eight. Because a righteous man puts his trust in the Lord. He counts on the Lord. He praises the Lord. He hopes in the Lord and gives God glory for every situation. Like Paul said in 1 Thessalonians, in every circumstance, let us give thanks to the Lord because that is the will of God for our lives. Hallelujah to Jesus. I'm going to get up today out of this pew and I'm going to say no longer will I have a fear of death because I know Him who conquered death Hell in the grave, his name is Jesus, and he went to the cross for me, and he hung and died and bled for me, and he gave his life for me, and they buried him, and in three days he rose from the dead because he is the resurrection and the life. And anyone, though he may lose his life, yet shall he find it, I'm going to put my trust in that. Amen. As of today, I'm no longer willing to accept a little, but I know that God will bless me with much if I'm faithful. To do what he calls me to do, he's faithful to supply me with much. I'm no longer going to put my hope in men or money or my bank or finances or my family or my political ideologies. I'm not going to put my trust in my education or my ability to do things on my own. No, I'm going to put my trust in the Lord and I'm not going to lean on my own understanding. But in every situation, I'm going to run to Jesus and I'm going to ask him and he will direct my path. And no matter if I get it wrong, I'm going to trust that Romans 8.28 promises me that He works all things together for my good because I love Him and I'm called according to His purpose. I'm going to walk strong in the Lord because He is my strength. He is my supply. He is my song. He is my strong tower. He is my refuge and He is my rock and I shall not be afraid. Psalm 23 verse 1 tells me that yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because He is with me. His rod and His staff, they comfort me. Proverbs 12 25 says that anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. Matthew 6.34 says in ex that we should not be anxious. Exodus tells me that the Lord will fight for me. Psalm 27.1 says that the Lord is my light. The Lord is my salvation. Whom shall I fear? He is the stronghold in my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Come on somebody. I'm going to believe and hope and pray to the God of all comfort 
and strength and joy that He would empower me with His Spirit today so that I would no longer have any fear of the unknown, of dread, of circumstance, of abandonment, because I know that He said He would never leave me. He would never forsake me. I'm going to put my trust not in man, because I know that man will fail me every time, but the Lord is faithful and just to complete everything He said He would do. He cannot fail. He will not fail. He's never late. He's always on time. He's never too far from me, and I'll never be alone. The battle has already been won. And the battle is the Lord's and not mine. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Church, listen to me today. I'm going to boldly stand in the power of His might and stand for righteousness and walk in the strength that God has given me and believe that I have already overcome the world because He that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. And I'm going to pray today that He would infuse me with a perfect love because perfect love casts out all fear. And I'm going to ask for His perfect peace in my life, in my mind, and in my home, and for my family. Because Jesus said, my peace I give you, not as the world gives, my peace I leave with you. He said that if I would walk in Him and walk in the light, I would never walk in darkness. That I would have perfect love, and my love would be made perfect in Him. He said that if I would keep my mind on Him, He would give me perfect peace. He said that I, if I would be anxious for nothing, but in all things, I would pray and ask and seek the Lord with all my heart that He would give me perfect peace. The peace that passes all understanding, that's a mind-blowing peace, an unshakable peace, an immovable peace, an unbreakable peace, that I should not be worried about my life, that I should not worry about what I would eat, or what I would drink, or what I would wear, but that the Father knows all these things that I have need of, even before I ask, that my heart would be focused on the Word of God, and accomplishing His will in the earth, and seeking His kingdom and His righteousness first, and all, how many? Some? No, all, all these things would be added to me. Whatsoever things I need, hallelujah to Jesus. I love you. When Moses was in the desert and he was fleeing for his life and he was gone for 40 years and he came to encounter God at the burning bush and God made him a mandate and he took another 40 years to get to the promised land. He was fearful, but he did it anyway. But before he had, he had to go get God's people out of Egypt and he went through trial after trial and tribulation and suffering and famine and disease and death and fear. And then once of all, he got all of God's people out and they ran, they ran to the end of the road. But what was he going to do there? There was no time to turn back. There was no time to make excuses. There was no time to fail, only to trust in the living God. So he picked up his staff, and he trusted in the Lord God that said, I am that I am. And he put that staff in the water, and the water split, and they walked across dry land, and all the Hebrew people's enemies were wiped from the earth, and Egypt is still a desert today. Because God will never take you to a place that His grace cannot take you through. Hallelujah to Jesus. Hallelujah. When the three Jewish boys, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were being told that if they didn't obey the words of the ruler of that time to worship a man-made idol and go against the commands of God that they would be thrown into the furnace. And guess what? They were thrown into the furnace because they refused to disobey the Almighty God, Jehovah. And when the king looked into the furnace in Daniel 3.19 and saw that they weren't being burned, he asked them to turn the fire up seven times hotter, and they still weren't burned. And later in the same passage, in Daniel chapter 3, verse 24, the king again asked, Did I not throw three men into the fire to be burned? Because they didn't obey my decree. And now I see a fourth man in the fire. And he says he's shining bright. Like that of the Son of God. Because we serve a God that is able to deliver us. From a blazing furnace. And from any trial that we might be facing. Jesus Christ is the fourth man in your fire. And they didn't even so much as get singed. Just when the enemy thought these guys were toast. They came out with the most. Hallelujah. Jesus. Amen. They came out in victory because Jesus said in John 6.39, This is the will of Him who sent me, that I shall not lose one that He has given me, 
but I shall raise him up on the last day. You are mine, declares the Lord. And let me remind you that in these last days, on that final day when the trumpet sounds, every eye shall see and every tongue shall confess and every knee shall bow that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. So as we read this passage again in Matthew 8, 26, when the disciples came to him and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're perishing. He said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? And then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So then the men marveled, saying, Who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? And they got to the other side. Let me tell you right now, folks, we're in the boat with Jesus Christ. And there is nothing to fear. He said that we would get across to the other side to the promised land that he made for us. Because the God of the Bible is able to keep us from falling. He's able to provide more than we ask. He's able to answer every prayer. He's able to protect from the snare of the fowler. And under his wings we'll find safety. He's able to deliver us from every disease. Psalm 91. A thousand may fall at your side. And ten thousand at their right hand. But it shall not come nigh thy dwelling. He is able to give us life and life in abundance. He is the word from the beginning. He is greater than we know. More powerful than any king or ruler in this age. And in the age to come. He is in the beginning of Genesis. Everything that we need from Genesis to Revelation. He is the breath of life. And in Exodus, He is the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, He is our high priest. In the book of Numbers, He is the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, He is the prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, He is the captain of our salvation. In Judges, He is our judge and our lawgiver. In the book of Ruth, He is our kinsman redeemer. In 1st and 2nd Samuel, He is our trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles, He is our reigning king. In Ezra and Nehemiah, He is the rebuilder of broken down walls of human life. In Esther, He is our Mordecai. In Job, He is our ever-living redeemer. In Psalms, He is our shepherd and we shall not want. In Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, He is our wisdom. In the Song of Solomon, He is our loving bridegroom. In Isaiah, He is the Prince of Peace. In Jeremiah, He is the righteous branch. In Lamentations, He is our weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, He is the wonderful four-faced man. In Daniel, He is the fourth man in the fiery furnace. Hallelujah to Jesus. In Hosea, He is the faithful husband. Forever married to the backslider. In Joel, he is the baptizer of the Holy Ghost with fire. In Amos, he is our burden bearer. In Obadiah, he's mighty to save. In Jonah, he is our great foreign missionary. In Nahum, our strength and shield. In Habakkuk, he is our God evangelist crying, Revive thy works, O Lord. In Zephaniah, he's our Savior. In Haggai, he's the restorer of God's lost heritage. In Zechariah, he is the fountain opened up in the house of David for sin and uncleanliness. And in Malachi, he is the son of righteousness rising with healing in his wings. In Matthew, he is the king of the Jews. In Mark, he is our servant. In Luke, He is the Son of Man. He feels what you feel. In John, He is the Son of God. In Acts, He is the Savior of the world. And there is no other name under heaven by where man can be saved but by the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. In Romans, He is the righteousness of God. In 1 Corinthians, the Rock and the Father of Israel. In 2 Corinthians, He is the triumphant one giving glory. In Galatians, he is your liberty because He has set you free. In Ephesians, He is the head of the church. In Philippians, He is our joy. In Colossians, He is our completeness. In 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, He is our hope. In 1st Timothy, He is your faith. 2nd Timothy, your stability. In Titus, He is truth. 
In Philemon, he is your benefactor. In Hebrews, he is the perfecter and the author of our faith. In James, he is the power behind your faith. In 1 Peter, he's your example. In 2 Peter, he is your purity. In 1 John, he is your life. Come on, somebody. In 2 John, he is our pattern. In 3 John, he is the motivation of life. In Jude, he is the foundation of your faith. And in Revelation, he is your coming king. He's the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is the keeper of all creation and the creator of all. He's the architect of the universe, the manager of all times. He always was, he always is, and he always will be. Unmoved, unchanged, undefeated, and never undone. He was bruised, but brought healing. He was pierced, but brought healing. He was persecuted and brought freedom. He was dead, and he brought life. He is risen, and he brings power. He reigns, and he brings peace. The world can't understand him. Armies can't defeat him. Schools can't explain him. And leaders can't ignore him. Herod couldn't kill him. The pharaohs and the Pharisees couldn't confuse him. People couldn't hold him. Nero couldn't crush him. Hitler couldn't silence him. And the new age cannot replace him. Science can't explain him away. He is love, life, longevity, and all good things. Kindness, gentleness. He is holy righteousness. Mighty and powerful. He is your redeemer. He is your savior. He is your guide. He is your peace. Your joy. Your comfort. He is the Lord and he is the ruler of our lives. Hallelujah to Jesus. Of whom shall I fear? Why should we have fear? This is the God that's in the boat with us. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's stand to our feet. Hallelujah to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Oh, thank you, Lord, for the power. The power of your spirit and the power of your word, Father. And we thank you that right now, Lord God, we have no fear, Lord. Because we know that you are with us, Lord. We have no fear, God, because we know that you have already done it all. All we have to do is hide under your wings, Father. In the shadow of the Almighty, we find our refuge. Thank you, Lord God, that as we allow the Word of God to soak into our minds and into our hearts and to go way down deep into our spirit, Father, that we leave today forever changed, knowing that fear is a liar and you are the truth. And nothing, nothing can separate us. Nothing can overtake us. You are still on the throne and you are still in control. You are all things to all people, Father. You are the great I am. You are the God that is unmovable, unshakable, unbreakable, Father. You are so mighty. And we thank you, Lord God, that we can now forever trust you, Lord God. That we have no reason to fear anything, nothing in this life, Father. And that we can do all things through you because you give us strength, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. And right there where we're standing, let's pray. If there's anybody in here who still says, but I still feel like I'm scared of something, I want you to raise your hand because I want to pray for you. If there's still something that you're afraid of, if there's somebody in here who says, you know, I got plenty of time to get saved. I can do what I want. I can live it up. I can have a good time. I just want to have fun. I can get saved tomorrow. Let me tell you that today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that God is calling you. And don't say, well, he's not really calling me. If you hear my voice in your ear today, God is calling you. Yes. And he wants you. He's looking for you. He sees you running. He sees you going by the way. He sees you thinking, I can do it on my own. Anytime I want, I can get saved. But let me tell you, there was millions of people that didn't wake up this morning. They had no idea that it was their last day. We could walk out of here right now and that might be the last breath we take. Don't wait. The Bible says, don't stiffen your neck. When God calls you, 
run to him because he knows what your future holds. We don't, but he does. And I want to tell you right now, if that's you, I want you to run up here right now in the name of Jesus and say, I hear the voice of the Lord calling me today and I'm going to give my life to him because I want him to take care of me, to bless me, to keep me healthy and to do everything that he's called me to do. I want that today. If that's you, just raise your hand. I want to pray for you. There might be somebody there on the internet that's hearing this right now. And they're watching and they can't take their eyes off of it because they know something in their heart is going off saying, I feel like God is calling me. I feel like that's me. And let me tell you, you walk out of here today, you, you turn this off today and you go off and you're going to keep hearing it replaying in your mind. It's not going to leave you alone. He's going to keep calling you and he's going to bother you and he's going to wake you up and he's going to keep after you. And when you're in those dark places, he's going to be whispering to you and you're going to feel that conviction so heavy in your life. You're going to have no choice but to turn around and run to Jesus because he's calling you today. He's calling you today. So Lord, I thank you, God, that perfect love casts out all fear, God. You know the heart of them that you're calling, God. You know their lives. You know their situations. You know everything about their lives, God. You know what they're going to do the minute they walk out of here and where they're going to go, Lord. You know the plans that they are devising even in their hearts right now. And I thank you, God, that you're going to turn their lives around as of today. That they're going to wonder, why does my life not go the way I want it to anymore? It's because God has a different way for you. God has a different path for you. God has a calling on your life so strong because he wants to use your life. He wants to use you as an instrument for his glory. To show his power. To show his peace in your life. He's got a different way for you. So, Lord, I thank you, God, that the word of the Lord has gone forth and you're going to bring it before all, every heart that needs to hear it, every eye that needs to see it, every ear that needs to hear it, Father. For your word declares that he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being able to open the word of God and learn from you, to eat of the bread of life, to drink of the living water, Father. May we forever be changed from this time forth. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Bless the Lord.